The book called The Road to Hell was advertised in a national magazine in England as Read David Pawson's Autobiography, <laughs> The Road to Hell. <laughs> But actually, that book was a miracle. I was going to Italy to speak at a conference, and I had a, a big case with my clothes in and a little brief, black briefcase, and inside the briefcase was the entire manuscript of the book, The Road to Hell. And I write all my books with a fountain pen, and there was only one manuscript of it. And when I got to the uh, airport in Bologna, it was midnight, it was dark, and the rain was pouring down. And we went to the uh, car park, and uh, the pastor meeting me said, get into the car, and I'll put your luggage in the back of the car. I think you call the boot the... Sorry? Right, the trunk, that's it. So uh, we got to his house an hour later, and he opened the trunk and pulled out my case and then closed the trunk. I said, just a minute, there's my briefcase. No, he said there was only the case. And he hadn't seen the black briefcase on the luggage trolley because it was so dark and wet. But I said, all my notes for the conference are in that briefcase, and there's a manuscript of a whole book called The Road to Hell in that briefcase. We dashed back to the airport at one in the morning, no sign of the briefcase, no sign of the luggage trolley. Went to the lost property office, they hadn't had it handed in. We went to the police and said, we've lost a briefcase, and the police smiled and said, you lost a briefcase in Italy? <laughs> as much as say, that's the last you'll see of it. Well, uh, I was sleeping in a garage that night, actually, and I knelt down by a camp bed and said, Lord, you've given me a wonderful opportunity to find out if you want that book published. I said, if you want it published, you'll have to find it and bring it back, because I'm not going to write it again. <laughs> and uh, I said, if you don't want it published, I don't want it back. The next day, I drove 100 miles to the Adriatic coast to a hotel where the conference was. And I went for a lovely walk on the beach early morning and a dog joined me, lovely friendly dog, and we had a lovely time together. I came back to the hotel, and a man walked up to me and put my briefcase in my hand. And to this day, we do not know who he was or where he'd been. That's, this is a hundred miles away the next morning. And I opened it, and all the manuscript was there, but all the pages had been put into the wrong order. And it took me about half an hour to put the pages in the right order, but not a page was missing. And that's how that book came to be published. So I'm sure that God wanted me to publish that book. But it's not a popular subject. Well, there's another book I'm talking about tonight, and my problem is how to give you the whole book in an hour. We're going to have to put our running shoes on. Once saved, always saved, question mark. There's another book by the same publisher with the same title without the question mark. And that's by a, a good friend of mine called Dr. R.T. Kendall, whom I'm sure some of you will have heard of. But uh, we differ on this point. Now, what I'm going to teach you tonight comes straight out of last night. I was talking about grace and talking about saving grace. But then I pointed out that there are two other views of grace, one called sovereign grace, 
one called free grace, and one matter on which they both agree is once saved, always saved, but for entirely different reasons. Sovereign grace says grace is irresistible, it will force you to be saved, and it will force you to be kept, and it will force you to the point where you are completely saved, and you can do nothing about that. God has decided, he has chosen you, and therefore you will be once saved, always saved. Free grace also agrees to that, Free grace comes more from the dispensational school, while sovereign grace comes from the Calvinist school or the Reformed school. But uh, free grace also says, when you come to Christ, not only are all your past sins forgiven, but all your future sins are forgiven too. Therefore, nothing you can do can stop the process of salvation, whatever you do. It's all already signed, sealed, and delivered. You are saved. And I guess that my quarrel with that phrase is not only that it's not in the Bible, but I don't agree with the first part of it. That's my problem. I'm not once saved yet. And therefore, I'm not always saved yet. One day, I'm going to shout as loud as I can I'm once saved, so I'm always saved, but I can't say it yet. When my salvation is complete, when my wife's husband is perfect, then I'm going to shout, once saved, always saved, because the most important thing, I'm going to repeat myself quite a bit here, is what you think saved means. And in my understanding, it means to be free from all sin, all sins, and to be exactly what God meant me to be when he made me, restored to the perfect image of God. And since Christ is the perfect image of God, it means when I'm actually like Jesus through and through, and when we stand by side by side, you won't be able to tell the difference. That's the objective of sal salvation. God wants to restore us. And all that comes from the very beginning of creation. Because one of the questions that we need to ask is, why did God make us? And that's a very important question. And the answer is, he already had one son, and he enjoyed that so much that he wanted a bigger family. I can't explain more simply why God created you and me. God wanted a bigger family like his son. And until we're like his son, God can't fully enjoy that family. His own son was so trusting and obedient that when we are perfect in love too, he can fully enjoy family life with us. That's why he made the world, that's why he made us, to have a bigger family like his existing son. And you can understand that. Parents who love their child usually want another, like the first. But that was God's intention in creation. When you go right to the end of history, you find the other end of that purpose because you find that God's intention is to make a brand new universe that will never know sin, that will never be polluted, that will never be spoiled by war. He has written off this present universe and he's going to make another one. And therefore, if he's going to put people in it, he must make them perfect before he does. Otherwise, it'll be the same as this one. I heard a story of a professor who invented a television set that you could tune into the future to see what was going to happen. 
and he gathered people around for the first time to demonstrate his new TV. And they asked him to switch ahead 30 years. And he fiddled with the knob to 30, and the picture came, and they all gasped. The whole earth was devastated. Nothing but ash everywhere. As far as the eye could see, there'd clearly been a nuclear holocaust, and everything had gone. And the people there stared at this screen, and then to their surprise, the ash began to stir a little, and out from the ash came a little boy monkey. And he looked around and he said, they've done it, haven't they? And I'm the only bit of life left. And he sat there looking very miserable and depressed, when suddenly, just a few meters away, the ash stirred again and out came a little female monkey. And the male monkey thought, life's not so bad. <laughs> and he went up to her and took her by the paw and said, but look what people have done to our world. He said, we'll have nothing to eat. And she said, well, I've got something. I've managed to save something. And she opened her paw and here was a little apple. The male monkey looked at it and he said, don't let's begin that all over again. <laughs> <laughs> But when we look ahead, we see a new heaven and a new earth, and new people to inhabit it, people who will never spoil it, place where there's no sin and no temptation, and everything can be enjoyed to the full. That's God's idea. He meant the Garden of Eden to be like that, but it got spoiled so quickly. But he's going to do it again. But this time he's prepared to take people who have spoiled this world and make them into creatures restored to his image and now perfect and able to look after his world properly. That's a great idea and that's the future. So whether we look at the beginning of creation or the future of a new creation, we see God's plan and purpose all the way through of having a larger family who will please him and with whom he can have real fellowship. That's God's purpose. And that's why I want to underline again that salvation is a process which takes time. It's a process of taking old sinful people like us and making us into new people. That's because God loved us. He could have said, I'm going to wipe out this world and wipe out all the people in it and start again. He once nearly did that. And he could do that. He once nearly did it in the days of Noah's flood. And he wiped out that generation. But he saved one family. Alas, one of the first things Noah did when he got out of the ark was to get drunk and expose himself to his own son. And the whole sad story started again. It's almost as if God said, right, that doesn't work. I'll have a better plan than that. And the plan was to save sinners and make them into saints and then make the new world. Do you realize that creation is happening again, but in reverse order? In the first creation, he made the heavens and the earth, and then he put the people in it later. This time around, he's making new people first. And when he's got enough new people ready, he'll make a new heaven and a new earth last. It's creation in reverse. We are now in the second week of creation. But I'm going to say much more about that tomorrow morning. But isn't that an exciting thought? God's gone back to work and is creating again. And incidentally, that's one reason why we worship on a Sunday and not on a Saturday. The Jews worship on a Saturday to celebrate the finish of his old creation. We worship on a Sunday to celebrate the beginning of a new creation. But more of that 
tomorrow morning. Well, now, once saved, always saved. What does it mean to be once saved? I've told you it means to be perfect. It means to be the people God wanted you to be. And that's going to take him time and take us time. And the three stages of salvation are when we're set free from the penalty of sin, which we call justification, when we're set free from the power of sin, which we call sanctification, and when we're set free from the possibility of sin, and that's called glorification. And those are the three steps which God intends, and all of them comprise salvation. And you can't say, I'm one saved until you reach all three. And that's when I'm going to shout. And that'll probably coincide with the Lord's return to earth. There's a verse in Hebrews that says that he will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And I'm waiting for him, and that's future. And I'm waiting for my sa salvation. I'm looking forward to being saved, and that's when I'm going to shout, once saved, always saved when the work is complete. If you say it before then, you think the work's past. When you use the verb save only in the past tense, looking back and say, I was saved then, you're talking as if it's finished, as if it's all complete. And I teach people never to say, I was saved there and then, but to say, I began to be saved there and then. And what a difference that makes to your thinking when you say that. I began to be saved in 1947. And yet it's obvious to anyone who knows me that the, it's not complete yet, particularly to my wife. She knows I'm not there yet. But she knows that I'm not what I was. And I love the man who prayed, Lord, I'm not what I was, sorry, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but praise the Lord, I'm not what I was. <laughs> and that's where we all are. I'm not what I ought to be yet. I'm not what I'm going to be, but praise the Lord, I'm not what I was. That's the process of salvation that God is doing. And he's doing a good work in me and he will complete the work that he's begun, provided I cooperate with him. You see, the question before us tonight is, can I interrupt the process of salvation? Can I delay it? Can I stop it altogether? Or as people generally ask, can I lose my salvation? Well, if you haven't got it all yet, you can't lose it all. <laughs> but uh, you've started being saved. Can you lose that? Or is it automatic, inevitable, that it will be completed? Notice that whenever the scripture talks about the process being completed, there is an expression not of certainty, but of confidence. Paul, writing to the Philippians, says, I am confident that the Lord who began a good work in you will complete it against that day. And the letter to the Hebrews does the same thing. After giving a solemn warning that those who go back cannot return because they cannot repent, he then adds, but I am confident that this won't happen to you. Now that's not saying I'm certain it won't. It's saying I have high hopes that in your case, the job will be completed. And we need to notice that word confident. It's not the word certain. It's meaning I have high hopes that in your case, it will be completed. I thought tonight one of the things we should do is do a bit more Bible study and look at some of the passages 
which teach that the process of salvation can be interrupted and delayed and even stopped altogether so that it never is completed. Did you find that in your Bible? Well, we'll find it tonight. And so I thought we'd look at passage after passage. But do you know this? And I say this in my book. There are 80 passages in the New Testament warning you not to allow the process to stop. 80 separate passages. Every writer of the New Testament has a warning to Christians not to lose what they found in Christ. That's enough for me, 80. And we'll look, we haven't time to look at all 80, but I've listed them in this book. So you can look them up for yourself. And those warning passages are rarely taught by preachers. We love the texts that give us assurance of the future. We love such texts as, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's at the end of Romans 8. And you'll hear that quoted again and again. But what preachers don't point out is that there's one thing missing from that list of things that can't separate us from God's love, and that's yourself. Did you ever notice that? When Jesus said, no one can snatch you from my hand, he did not say that you can't jump out of his hand. And all those lists of things that cannot prevent us from staying in God's love. Don't include yourself, not one of them. It's a comfort to know that nothing else and no one else can stop the process of salvation. But you can. And that's the serious thing that I'm teaching tonight. Because the scripture invariably balances up the picture. And when there's a verse like that, it isn't far away that you'll find another verse that says something very different. And one of the passages out of those 80 in the New Testament is in Romans 11, where it says, and if you do not continue in God's kindness, you too will be cut off like many of the Jews were cut off. And that's only on the next page after that wonderful statement in Romans 8. Now this is the problem with our Bible. God didn't put chapter and verse numbers in it. And therefore you can't, if you have a Bible without verses and chapter numbers, did you know there was one published? You can now get the New International Version without chapter numbers and without verse numbers. Do I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah. No, don't say it because the preacher asked. <laughs> but none of you said hallelujah spontaneously there. But there's a Bible you can buy without chapter and verse numbers. Wouldn't you like one? Hallelujah. Well, a friend of mine, a professor of law, in a university in Malibu, in California. Um, his name is Lagard Smith. He produced that Bible with no chapter and verse numbers in it. And uh, I hope you'll get a copy because you'll have to know your Bible a bit better to find anything in the Bible. You have to know the context and you have to read the context. You can't pick out a text as a kind of proof for a doctrine. You have to take the text in its context. And I have noticed in the Bible, wherever there's a verse that tells us that he is able to keep us, there's another verse that tells us we must keep ourselves. What a balance. Take the little letter of Jude. At the end of the letter of Jude, it says, God is able to keep you. 
and present you faultless before his throne of majesty. He's able to. But just three verses up from that wonderful promise, there's another verse that says, keep yourselves in the love of God. There's the balance. And if you only quote one of those two texts, you're unbalanced. Take Paul's letter to Timothy, his letters. In one verse he says, he is able to keep what I've committed to him. But if you only read that verse, you'll not read the companion verse just about on the same page that says, I have kept the faith. Keeping going is a cooperation between you and God. He's able to keep, and you are to keep. And this balance is everywhere in Scripture. But if you only quote texts, you come out with a one-sided balance. Imbalance. Wherever we read about God's keeping power, you'll find an exhortation to keep yourself. And as we keep ourselves in the love of God, he keeps what we've committed to him. That's the balance. That's the whole truth and not a dangerous half-truth. So there's a responsibility on us to go on cooperating with God, to go on believing in him, to go on responding to his kindness, to go on to the end and endure, and it's those who endure to the end who are saved. In other words, to put it quite bluntly, it's not those who start the Christian life or get saved, but those who finish Amen. in faith. What a lesson that is. And many, many people start, but they don't finish. And the New Testament is full of warnings to those who start and don't finish. Faith is a continual relationship of trust and obedience. And as long as we keep in the faith, he will keep us. Well, now, let's just uh, look at one or two of the passages out of those 80 which say this kind of thing. I've already mentioned Romans, but let me start in the Gospels. What about John 15? I am the true vine, said Jesus, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he trims clean so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And now he says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. There's the balance again. You stay in me, and I'll stay in you. But the underlying warning is, if you don't stay in me, I won't stay in you. There it is. So what will happen if we don't remain? No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And now the warning. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. There it is very clear. You remain, you stay, you live in me. 
and I will remain in you and will produce fruit together. Can I say this very clearly? Eternal life is not in me. It's in Christ. And if I stay in Christ, I have eternal life. But he didn't give eternal life to me. It's still in him, as John says somewhere else. This life is in his son. I don't have eternal life in me, but I do have it in Christ. A branch doesn't have life in itself. The vine has the life. And if the branch stays in the vine, it'll go on living. But if the branch gets cut off, it'll die. So I have eternal life in Christ. I don't have it in David Pawson. And if I remain in Christ, I go on having eternal life. That's what John 3.16 actually says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing in him will never perish, but go on having eternal life. There it is. If you remain in Christ, you have life. But if you don't, you'll die, and the dead branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. Now that's just one passage, and that's in the same gospel where you read Jesus saying, I know my sheep and none will pluck them out of my hand. But you need to balance it up with this passage and take the whole truth together, the whole gospel tells you the whole truth. Let me now turn to Romans. I've already quoted that wonderful verse, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wonderful promise. But now turn just one page, and let's read chapter 11, in which Paul is talking to Gentile believers about the Jews. And he points out that not all the Jews made it. In fact, out of two and a half million Jews who left Egypt, two made it into the promised land. And Paul in the letter to Corinthians says, that's a lesson for us to learn. Setting out from Egypt is only the beginning. Getting into Canaan was the end of his redemption for them. But most of them never made it. And he said, that's a warning to us. It's not setting out, it's getting in. It's not starting, it's finishing that is going to be the thing. And so having talked about some of the Jews, many of them, who were cut out of God's people one way or another, he says in um, verse 19, verse 18, do not boast over those branches, the Jews who were cut out. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grand grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also 
will be cut off. He's talking about the Jews to the Gentile believers in Jesus. And he said, they were cut off. But don't let that make you arrogant or secure. Because God will deal with you in the same way he dealt with them. He's the same God. And if you do not continue in his kindness, you too will be cut off. I don't think you can twist those words around. They can only have one message. And it is that we are no more secure than the Jews were if we don't continue trusting in God. That's a serious passage. How often have you heard it quoted by preachers? The big problem with all of us preachers is that we select the verses we preach on. And we don't preach on all of them. We select those, and if you're not careful, we select those that we know the people like to hear. The comforting texts. And we just keep the others a little bit quiet. I believe that we should be preaching the whole Bible. The whole Word of God. The whole counsel of God. In fact, Paul said to the Ephesians when he left Ephesus, you know how I've taught you, I have declared to you the whole counsel of God, the whole truth. Let's turn the pages to Hebrews. And I'm not going to read Hebrews 6, though that's the passage that you may think I was going to read, where it actually says that if you turn away from Christ after you have belonged to him, there is no possible repentance. There's no way back. I've been asked by some Christians, how far do you have to backslide before you can't come back? I say, that's a dangerous question. Don't even run the risk. There was a, a rich lady in England advertised for a chauffeur to drive her Rolls Royce. And she asked each applicant for the post, how near could you drive to the cliff edge without the car going over? And one applicant said, well, I would go about six feet from the edge. Another said, I would go about three feet. But one applicant said, madam, you are so valuable that I wouldn't go near a cliff edge. <laughs> and he got the job. <laughs> now, the, the, to ask how far do I have to backslide before I reach the point of no return, that's someone playing with fire. That's someone saying, how near can I get without going over? The wrong question. Don't go anywhere near that. Don't backslide. Because it's quite clear from Bible teaching that there is a point of no return. I don't know what that point is, only God knows. But don't run the risk. Don't even think about how far you have to backslide. Stay right there in Christ. So I'm not reading chapter 6, though I have noted already that it finishes, we want each of you, sorry, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. And though he's giving them a warning of the point of no return, he says, I'm confident, not certain, I'm confident that you won't go anywhere near that point. But God's patience can run out. And we need to remember that. But I'm going to turn to chapter 10 where there is, to me, a far more serious warning, though many people have not noticed it. Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment 
and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And a verse or two further he says, so don't throw away your confidence. Now that's a serious word, listen carefully. If you deliberately keep on sinning after you've received the knowledge of the truth, not even the cross of Christ is available for that. He is echoing the book of Leviticus. All the sacrifices in Leviticus were for accidental sin, unintended sin that you just fell into but didn't intend to, and then you brought a sacrifice for unintended sin. But here we're dealing with someone who quite deliberately, knowing what they're doing, having the knowledge of the truth, goes on living in the same way, and therefore cutting themselves off from the efficacy of the cross. That's a serious warning. Let's turn to one other passage and then perhaps we'll break from Bible reading and look at some other matters. Turn to the second letter of Peter. Verse 20 of chapter 2. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome. They are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on it, on the sacred commandment that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true, a dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to wallowing in mud. Wonder if you ever heard a sermon on that passage. To say to someone, if having escaped from the world by knowing Jesus as your Savior, you then go back to the old way of life, you are worse off than if you had never known the way of salvation. Now, if backsliding simply robbed you of your reward in heaven, but you were still able to go there, then frankly, you're not worse off than you were before. But this is saying you are worse off to have started the Christian life and escaped from the world and then go back into it. You are worse off because you are more responsible now. You have known the way of salvation and now you've turned your back on it and you knew what it did for you. That's a very serious warning and one that we should note in Holy Scripture. It's God's Word. And therefore, people who have started and known the liberty in Christ, the freedom from sin that he offered, and then go back. It's characteristics of dogs when they're sick that they go back and lick up the sick. And I know what pig farmers are like. I know what pigs are like, given the right 
care of pigs. They're one of the cleanest animals on the farm. But not given the right care, they just love to go back. And when you've washed them clean, perhaps from an agricultural show, and they look beautiful and pink and nice, put them anywhere near some mud, and they go right back into it. And Peter here says, you're worse off than if you'd ever not known. Which doesn't mean you're still going to heaven, but will lose a bit, bit of reward. It means you're not going to heaven. You've known the freedom that Christ can bring, and now you've turned your back on it. Now, I could take you to 80 passages in the New Testament, like those I've read to you. 80. And one passage from every writer of the New Testament has a warning in it like that somewhere. And if you read the Gospels, Jesus had that warning more than once. When he told the parable of the sower, he said, it's possible to receive the word of the kingdom and for it to begin to grow in you, and then for it to be choked by the cares of this world. Warning after warning in Scripture, which we ignore at our peril. David, are you trying to make us scared? Yes. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the New Testament doesn't leave the fear of the Lord behind in the old. It's there in the new as well. Again and again, fear the Lord. What is there to fear from the Lord? The answer is hell. When I wrote that book on hell, I say in that book, I fear hell. I'm not one of those preachers that say, you unbelievers are all going to hell, but I'm going to heaven. Blow you, Jack, I'm all right. I cannot preach like that. I can only preach on hell because I fear going there myself. I fear, as Paul said, lest having preached to others, I should be cast away myself. It's a very healthy fear. When we brought up three children, we wanted to teach them fear of the healthy kind, not phobia, a phobia is when fear paralyzes you and so dominates you that you can't move, can't do anything. But we wanted our three children to be afraid of the traffic on the roads. We wanted them to have a healthy fear and we didn't give them bicycles until they had that healthy fear of traffic. And one of our daughters was involved in a very bad accident uh, she escaped, but the others didn't. But um, we taught them to have a healthy fear, a fear of dirt, a fear of infection, but a healthy fear. It becomes a phobia if your children don't ride their bicycles on the road. But a healthy fear, and they can go. And... Uh, you taught your children healthy fear. And the Bible does. There's a healthy fear of the Lord, and it's related to the fear of his judgment, the fear of final rejection. That's a healthy fear, and we need more of it. The one thing I miss in so many churches I go to is the fear of the Lord. There's a kind of palliness with God that is very disturbing. I think I've told you that one young man said to me, we worship God almighty in our church. And I'm afraid that summarizes quite a lot of worship, as if we're partying with God and just, he's a great guy and we're having great fun with him. It is a fearful thing, said the author of Hebrews, to fall into the hands of a living God. And I've heard preacher after preacher twist that verse and say, it's a fearful thing to fall out of the hands of the living God. That may be true, but in that verse it says, 
It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Occasionally I have preached in churches where people have trembled in the presence of God. And one group of Christians who did tremble before God were called the Quakers because they literally shook in their meetings as they realized that God Almighty was there. They're now called a society of friends. The word Quaker has gone out of use. But it was the early Quakers from where I lived in Buckinghamshire, England, who came out and established Pennsylvania. The man called Penn from a village next to where we lived in England who came out and brought Quakerism to one of your northeast states. William Penn, Pennsylvania. And he was a Quaker. He belonged to a people who were so aware of the presence of God. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in you. When did you last some, see someone working out their salvation in fear and trembling because they realized Almighty God was doing something in them? Well, I'm just throwing this out. I know I'm emphasizing one side of things, but it's the side that's been neglected because it's the side that people don't want to hear about. And I promised the Lord when I began to preach Lord, I want to give people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, because I care for the people I speak to. I want to give you what you need to hear, and these are things you need to hear. Now, of course, this raises a lot of questions in people's mind. One of those questions is the question of assurance. So let me deal with that. Do you mean, David, that we can't be sure of salvation, that we can't be sure of God's love? Do you mean we have to wake up every morning wondering whether we're still in or out? No, that's neurotic. <laughs> I don't wake up every morning, am I saved or am I not, or am I going to be saved or am I not? God wants us to be sure of him, of his purpose in you. And the New Testament is full of assuring promises to give you an assurance. But many Christians that I talk to are basing their assurance on the wrong thing. They want a written guarantee in the word of God that will give them assurance. You see, many people don't want to be saved, but they do want to be safe. Do you know what I mean by that? They're taking, they're coming into faith as if they're taking out a life insurance policy. They've been told, if you die tonight, will you be in heaven or hell? And they don't want to be in hell, so they take out a life insurance policy. And they're assured from the Bible that they're safe. You're not safe till you get there. But you can be sure that you're going. Because our assurance is not based on the promises of Scripture. Because the early Christians didn't have the Scripture. They didn't have the New Testament. So they didn't base their assurance on the Scripture. The assurance is based on the Spirit, not the Scripture but on the Spirit. And it's the Spirit himself who bears witness that we are the sons of God. And while we walk in the Spirit, we shall be sure where we're going. As soon as you're not walking in the Spirit and start walking your own way, you will lose your assurance. That's how you know when you're getting out of God's way. But as long as you're in the way of salvation, and the Spirit is leading you, 
you will have a witness in your spirit that you are on the way to heaven and that as you keep on the way, it's bound to get you there. I'm putting that in a very simple manner. It's as if the sat-nav is telling you you're on the right road. Just keep on this road and you're certain to arrive. That's the kind of assurance the Bible gives you. And it's an assurance from the Holy Spirit. He is the source of my assurance. And if I grieve the Spirit, the first thing that goes is my sureness, my assurance that I'm on the right way. That's my understanding of assurance. And the witness of the Spirit will be borne out by the witness of my conscience. If you read John's letter, you'll find it's full of this phrase, that you may know, that you may know. And he points to the Spirit first. How do we know? Because he has given us his Spirit. There it is. And how do we know? Because our conscience is witnessing that we're living a new life. And the two witnesses of the spirit within us and the conscience in us is going to make us very, very sure I'm on the way to heaven. That's my understanding of assurance, not the kind of deduction from a text that says the Bible says so, I believe it, that settles it. That's not a guarantee. It's not the assurance that we're offered. There is no absolute guarantee that you will make it. But you can still be very sure that you're on the way of salvation that leads to heaven. So that's one question I ask, get asked when I talk about uh, being saved and being sure that you're being saved. Notice I don't say we are sure that we have been saved, but we are sure we are being saved. We know within our hearts, from conscience and the spirit within us, I'm on the way and I will get there if I keep on this way. It's that little word, if, Underline that in your Bible, every text that puts an if in it. For example, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, we find Paul outlining the essentials of the Christian faith. And there are three. And he says, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, which we'll talk about tomorrow morning, and the resurrection of Christ which we'll begin to talk about tomorrow morning. These are the three fundamentals of the faith. And he says, this is the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are being saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. That's one of the if verses. And I could quote so many more that have that little word if in. There's an if, and it's always followed by an exhortation to hang on, to hold firmly, to press on. You're in a race, and it's no good saying I've started the race, so I'll guarantee I'll finish it. No, you press on to the end of the race, and you reach the end of the race. And that's what Jesus did. Even when the worst happened to Jesus, he pressed on. In spite of the shame that he was subject to, he pressed on. And he came through and he finished. And he was able to say on the cross, it's finished. I was given a prophecy many years ago when I was very uncertain about the future. It was about 1980. I was the minister of a successful, quote, church in England, and uh, things were going very well. 
And I knew that the church needed to move forward into the 80s, but I couldn't see my own place in it. And so I went away uh, on a retreat with about a hundred pastors. And I said, Lord, will you please tell me this week whether I am to go on leading this church or whether you have something else for me to do. And there I was, normally a pastor in that situation, having built new premises and filled them and got everything going, would want to stay there the rest of his life. But I wanted to do what the Lord wanted. And one of the speakers in that retreat, when he finished talking to us, said, I have a word from the Lord for four men here. I don't know who they are, but you will know whether you're one of the men that God wants to speak to. And he proceeded to give three words from the Lord, not one of which made any sense to me. And then he said, my son, you have ministered to the extent of your gift in the place where I certainly put you. And you are no longer bound to stay in that place. I set the land before you. But one thing I require of you, that you surrender all that remains to be done in that church into my hands, for it is my church, not yours. And that prophecy went, every word was going through my heart. And he finished by saying, and I want you to go out and so serve me that one day you will be able to look into my face and say, Lord, we did it. <laughs> Lovely word. And I took a recording of it home to the elders of the church and I said, I'm submitting that to you. I believe it was for me. But you've got to weigh and judge it. I'm not going to respond to that unless you confirm it. And the elders came back to me and said, we believe that's of the Lord. We'll let you go. And I went out into the unknown. And yet within two years, I'd spoken in 200 cities and towns in Britain. And I've been traveling ever since. I'm a tramp for the Lord. <laughs> But that's been going on, and here I am. I believe I'm here in God's will. And I tell you this, it's not boring <laughs> serving the Lord, but it's very tiring. <laughs> but I believe I'm doing what God wanted me to do. How did I get onto that? <laughs> I'll have to go back to where I was. The other question I've been, often been asked, one is about how can you be sure? How can you have assurance under what you're teaching? And I've said, I believe you can. But it's not the kind of written guarantee people want. But it's an inward assurance from the Holy Spirit in your conscience that you're on the right track that leads to heaven. And if you stay on that track, you'll make it. You'll get there. The other question I get asked about is the question of predestination. Now, it's a word in Scripture. I believe in the predestination of God. But people say, if God has predestined something for you, surely it's bound to happen. No, I believe that's a misunderstanding of the word predestination treating that word as if it's the same as predetermination. That's a very different word. Unfortunately, most people don't see the difference. To predetermine something is to make it happen, to force it to happen. It's bound to happen if it's predetermined. But God doesn't predetermine, he predestines. What is predestination? It is preparing a destiny for someone. And I can give you a very simple illustration. I grew up with an ambition to be a farmer. 
And when I left school at 16, I went onto the farm and worked on the farm. You may not believe it, but I used to get up at four in the morning to milk 90 cows. I couldn't do it now. <laughs> but that's where I got my complexion, working in the open air. And I'm mentioning that because on Friday night, I'm going to talk about a girl who worked in the open air and got a similar complexion. But there you are, that's a clue. Guess what I'm going to preach about? Don't tell me now. Well now, I enjoyed working on the farm and I thought, where will this career lead? One day my father called me into his study for he was a professor of agriculture in the university. And he said, David, I know you've wanted to be a farmer and I'm sharing this with you now that when you're 21, I've arranged for you to rent a farm for yourself. And I was terribly grateful to him for thinking of that. But I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Because a few weeks ago, my Heavenly Father told me to be a preacher. And it had happened in this way. I was already preaching, but not in churches, in the open air, down at the beach, outside cinema queues, wherever people gathered. And my pulpit was an American Jeep, an old army Jeep, and I would park this Jeep and stand up in the back and preach. I just wanted the world to know about Jesus. And so it came to the point one morning, I said, Lord, if you tell me by 12 o'clock today which you want me to be, preacher or farmer, I'll be what you want me to be. And all my forebears had been preachers or farmers or both, right back to John Wesley. But I said, tell me by midday today and I'll do what you want. That's the kind of guidance I have found to be so useful. And I don't do anything unless God clearly tells me. It's his responsibility to guide me. It's not my responsibility to try and read his mind. That's my thinking about guidance. And I've told the Lord, if you will tell me clearly what you want me to do, I'll do it. If you tell me clearly where to go, I'll go there. If you tell me clearly what to say, I'll say it. But you're my boss, and you've got to tell me. And then you know I'll do it. And I've kept my side of the bargain, and he's kept his. And it's his responsibility. Which of you going into work on a Monday morning would have a boss coming to you and saying, guess what I want you to do today? No. If the boss wants you to do something on Monday morning, he'll come and tell you. And if he doesn't come and tell you, you assume that he wants you to do on Monday what you did on Friday and to carry on where you are. Now that's my thinking about guidance. Don't move unless the Lord tells you clearly. Carry on doing what you're doing until he clearly says change of job change of location, whatever. I found that's important. Too many Christians put themselves in a case where, in the place where they've got to have guidance and got to do something and got to find it somehow, twisting God's arm until he tells them what he wants them to do. Don't change anything until he tells you to and then change. And it works beautifully. But if you get impatient and drop your job or leave the place where you are and then try and find something else that the Lord wants you to do, you're in trouble. Don't move until the Lord says, move. So that morning I said, Lord, if you want me to be a preacher or a farmer or even both, tell me by midday today. At 10.30 I'm having coffee with a friend who is also working on the farm 
And he looked at me and he said, David, you won't finish up behind a plow. You'll finish up in a pulpit. And I said, Lord, that's not clear enough. <laughs> and I left my friend, went out into the street, a street in the city of Newcastle in the northeast of England, and I could take you almost to the very stone on which I was standing when I met a retired Methodist minister whom I hadn't seen for years and years. And I said to Mr. Scott, it's lovely to see you again. How are you? And he didn't answer. He just said, David, why aren't you in the ministry? <laughs> I said, that's clear enough, Lord. <laughs> and so I never got the farm that my father had prepared for me. But if I had taken that farm, I could always have said, my father predestined me to be a farmer here. Do you understand what I'm saying? He didn't predetermine it. And I, in fact, said no. But had I said yes, I could have talked about predestination. What my father decided beforehand should be my destiny. And that's what predestination means. It doesn't mean that God treats me like a puppet and predetermines me to do that. But when I accept his plan, and it's a much better plan than mine, when I accept his plan, I can say he predestined. He prepared the plan. I've accepted it. And I now know that long before I accepted it, he planned it all. And as I look back over my life, I'm not proud of many things. I have regrets. But his plan for me has been absolutely right. Amen. And he predestined me for that. He had the plan long before I knew it. But at the age of 17, I submitted to that plan and said, okay, Lord, I'll do what you want. And I have no regrets about that. In fact, I wouldn't change places with anybody. And it's lovely to reach the end of your life and realize that you did keep to the plan God had for you. And he tailors the plan to each person. And I can see that even before I accepted this plan, he was preparing me for it. As a, a young farmer, we had what we called Young Farmers Club and they had speaking competitions. And I began to learn to speak in public before I became a Christian. And God was using the Young Farmers Club debates to prepare me to speak clearly and convincingly. And I can see he had the plan. <laughs> and he was preparing me for the plan. And the plan for me, that's predestination. And I love it. But it's not predetermination. He didn't force me to do it. I could have resisted it. I could have said no to my heavenly father and yes to my earthly father. And I'd be a farmer milking cows right now. I have no regrets because farming has become a real problem activity in our country. And many farmers are committing suicide because they're finding it difficult to make a living. So I don't regret it for that reason. I regret not being a farmer because I loved it. I enjoyed it. But I still wouldn't go back and make any other decision. So predestination fits in as well. Well, I think I must be drawing things to a close. The fear of the Lord is part of our walk with God. One day when we're perfect in love, all fear will go. There'll be no need for it. Perfect love casts out fear. But as long as your love is imperfect, there's a healthy fear of not making it. And that doesn't make me neurotic. I don't get up every morning wondering if I'm a Christian. 
But I know if I get out of that way of God and my assurance begins to go, thank you, Lord, for warning me. I'll get back on the road quickly. And that's why John Bunyan wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress. And he saw the Christian life as a way, as a road. And people began on that road and slipped off it. And when Pilgrim, in the, have you read Pilgrim's Progress? I hope you will. Because when he gets to the river Jordan at the end of the road and he sees the heavenly city in the distance and he realizes that all he needs to do is cross that river, he has a friend with him. And that friend looks at the river rather than the city and he says, that river's deep and it's dark and it's dangerous. I don't like to try crossing it. And the friend turns to the left and there's a path leading away and the friend leaves Pilgrim and goes down the path. And John Bunyan writes this, I saw then that there is a road to hell even from the gates of heaven. And that's where I got the title of my book, The Road to Hell. Even at the end of your pilgrimage, you can still get off the road. And perhaps when you get to my age, you have to be doubly careful not to let things go and get off that road, but to finish triumphantly. Now, my favorite hymn writer is Charles Wesley. His hymns are full of scripture. In an eight-line verse, you can have 16 verses of scripture mentioned. He was soaked in the Bible, and he had a great gift of poetry. And somebody once told me, if you can't find a hymn of Charles Wesley for them to sing after you've preached, you have to ask, should I have preached on that? <laughs> because he covered the whole Bible in 6,000 wonderful songs, and we've lost most of them. But there's one quite short song he wrote, and I want to read it to you now to prove that I've been preaching the right stuff because he wrote a hymn for it. <laughs> and here's the hymn. Our Lord... With trembling I confess, a gracious soul may fall from grace. The salt may lose its seasoning power and never, never find it more. Lest that my fearful case should be, each moment knit my soul to thee and lead me to the mount above through the low veil of humble love. Isn't that lovely? Well, that's my message. I'm afraid the vast majority of evangelical preachers would not preach what I've said tonight. Don't believe it because I've said it. Don't go away and say, do you know what David Pawson says? Don't you dare use my name. Go home. <laughs> go home. Study the Word of God. Get into your Bible and find out whether what I've told you is there. And then go and tell people what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. Amen.